Hello, I'm George Liston CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. These days, concerns about nuclear energy center mostly upon its bellicose potential. The fact of nuclear proliferation, the danger of hostile rogue states, and the aspirations of terrorist groups. These all haunt the imagination of policymakers. But there was a time, less than a generation ago, when the domestic role of nuclear installations was a major public question. Controversies over disasters like Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and the ill-fated Shoreham nuclear facility were landmark issues in that era. Now, there are still extremely important questions about nuclear facilities in this society, and their urgency will grow as the nation explores its options in meeting the energy crisis. What is most important is an understanding of what the human and social costs of nuclear research may be if wise planning and scientific responsibility are not paramount values. My guest is Kelly McMasters, author of Welcome to Shirley, a memoir from an atomic town. And welcome to Dialogues. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Kelly, it's great to have you here. Let me hold up your book for everyone great. to see. It's a very beautiful photo, actually, from the 1950s, the halcyon era <laughs> of, of the town of Shirley, which is a town on Long Island. Yes. And what I like about this book in particular, Kelly, is that it's literature, first of all, mm -hmm. and high literature at that. But it also gives us an aspect of public policy. We rarely get the, uh, what happens to people. Right. And in that sense, I found two moods as a reader in this book. One is a very elegiac portrait of a lovely working class, tight knit Long Island community in which you grew up. Mm -hmm. The other mood uh, was a sort of a strong indictment, really, of the neighboring uh, uh, nuclear research facility, Brookhaven National Laboratories. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the kind of contamination that they were causing uh, and the health problems that it caused. Now, first of all, your sense of exactly what emotions did play in, y in your head as you wrote this book, and, and perhaps in the same vein, why you felt compelled to write it in the first place. Well, I've started teaching writing, and um, when I was a student, and now I tell my students, we write to process. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing my graduate work in getting my MFA at Columbia, I kept writing uh, what I called essays, place-based essays. Mm -hmm. And I got to number seven or eight, and they all kept circling back to Shirley. Mm -hmm. And even if I started on a topic that seemed completely unrelated, I kept returning. And mm -hmm. my uh, wonderful, uh, one of my wonderful professors there said, you know, you really need to figure out why, what's there that, mm -hmm. that isn't complete and that you need to dig deeper and figure out. And um, I held them all out and, and there was this lurking presence in the background and it was this sort of haunted house on the hill of the Brookhaven National Lab. Mm -hmm. And in a way it really did act that way for the town because um, the lab is about 5,000 acres and um, it's hidden behind a cover of the Pine Barrens. Right. So you really can't see it. And as a kid, um, I would, you know, with my other friends, imagine what was going on back there. And it involved, you know, beakers and test tubes and white-coated lab mm -hmm. scientists. And um, a lot of the fathers did work there. Right. But they were in support. So whether they worked at the post office or um, as maintenance men or in the computer support system mm -hmm. or the cafeteria, um, they weren't part of the science, the act yeah. of science. So I actually didn't understand that there was something nuclear yeah. happening there um, for quite a while. So this is, book really is a, a kind of a, a project of discovery, discovery yeah. for you yourself about your true feelings. And as you began to understand these things, this kind of ominous lurking presence mm -hmm. in the Pine Barrens just next right. to the town, uh, did your resentment grow about, it about what it was doing? Yes. Um, the more I researched, and I did, I was able to go there for about a week and mm -hmm. research in the public reading room, which was actually quite difficult to muscle into, mm -hmm. but um, I got in there for almost a, a solid week and photocopied as much as I could. and, and um, there were some documents in there, especially some community relations documents that um, 
made it clear in, in the late 40s when it was first being built, or it was actually the last on the list. There were 17 other sites that were considered right. before, and um, each one, whether they were too close to New York City, or mm -hmm. um, the idea was to have it closer to the Northeast, so yeah. we would have some kind of um, scientific, um, some, some, something that would be available to the Northeast universities. And each one either you know, was too close to an aquifer or this mm -hmm. or that. And they finally settled on Camp Upton, which yeah. was yeah. Um, you know, a, a World War I and II internment camp, um, or induction camp, right. sorry. And um, at that point in time, Long Island was very sparsely populated. That it was. And it made more sense. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a sort of a watershed moment in 1960, and this is where yeah. it did sort of where the anger started right. and um, Shirley was the largest and fastest growing town in all of Suffolk County. I, I want to cover all of that and I, I want to actually start where you are right now and the origins of all of this and how this right. how this came to be because I saw it, I saw your book uh, Kelly as, as, as sort of telling us two sets of decisions really mm -hmm. about how the town of Shirley came to be situated there right. and how the Brookhaven National Laboratory and they're two very American stories mm -hmm. and, and let's let me see if I can combine them for our viewers the same way you do it in the book okay. first of all as to Shirley itself and Shirley is as I said is a working class community but it's in a lovely setting right. and it's right now to the very uh, much ballyhooed Hamptons which mm -hmm. is they were the rich and famous are spend their summers um, but it's the product of a really American entrepreneur a real uh, I don't want to say con artist, but a vaudevillian artist for sure, yes. a man named William Turnbull Shirley. Mm -hmm. Tell us briefly how Mr. Shirley made Shirley the community happen, where it did first of all. Well, he was a Brooklyn boy, mm -hmm. and he grew up um, enamored of the stage and the vaudeville houses and of celebrity, um, and he did actually first come to the area when he was signing up for World War I, and right. that's where they sent all the Brooklyn boys. That was Camp Upton. Camp yes, Upton. Camp Upton. Mm -hmm. and, um, he has this great quote that the first time he saw a tree, he thought it was a fire hydrant frozen green. And, <laughs> and um, I think he, he was a very working class boy. And he really thought, wouldn't it be great if people like me and like my family could have a piece of the ocean, a piece mm -hmm. of the country? And so when he came back, he, he went into real estate and realized, well, he first continued his attempt to, to um, mm -hmm. be in vaudeville, realized he didn't have the best voice, he didn't have the, a great act, and um, although some of his companion um, people that he played with mm -hmm. did go on to do great things, but he wasn't one of them. Mm -hmm. And he, I actually love his character because um, he's such a, kind of a huckster. Exactly. And he, which those are the best kinds to write about. It was, mm -hmm. he came back, um, There, are, there's a lot of lore about he was involved in one of the most famous um, one of the most famous fights of World War One, and um, it happened over in France. And as I started trying to recreate those scenes, mm -hmm. I did some research with the experts, and he wasn't there. He was not there, mm -hmm. um, which apparently was very common. Uh, a lot of people, Al Capone even said that he yeah. got a particular scar in his face from this fight, and it was sort of the fight to be in of the mm -hmm. war. And he wasn't. Um, you know, we're 99.9 yeah. percent. Sure, out of... But, but where he was, though, and, and yes. what he really did was promote this town. He was... Yes, he um, he stayed mostly, he was based in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and he actually never lived in the town. His wife and his son, his son actually wound up taking over after he died, but mm -hmm. his idea was to have the Atlantic City of Long Island pre-gambling. This is, you know, resorts, restaurants, right. just beautiful. He called it the town of flowers, and mm -hmm. every um, person that bought a house there, he showed up with the first flower box full mm -hmm. of flowers. Hours, and he really loved his town, and, yeah. and um, I think you know he he christened it Shirley after himself, and he had real high hopes, but it didn't turn out the way he hoped. It didn't, but it attracted a wonderful uh, community. I mean, you grew up there as a girl, and yes. the reader is struck by the closeness of ties. Yeah. The little girls you grew up with. Mm -hmm. Are still your friends, I'm sure, and, mm -hmm. and you grew up as young women, and and I mean, people extend one man extends your father a ten thousand dollar loan to buy a home, and that's a lot of money then. Right. Things like that go on, so it's it's a wonderful community in this place. But there's one thing about Mr. Shirley's entrepreneurship, Kelly, that I found as kind of a sub theme. <laughs> he didn't plan. No. I mean, I think sort of like 
you know, sort of grew where they grew. Yes. And you know, the, the water systems and all that kind of stuff sort of happened haphazardly. Right. And it seems to me that gets to be a thematic problem yeah. for Shirley as the years progress. Exactly. There is a map of what. Um, some say he he had in his mind someone else drew it up and he mm -hmm. thought well maybe this would work out but it doesn't reflect at all in what is there um, mm -hmm. it was more by the sales and and you know the streets sort of haphazardly yeah. just and there's no main street and I think mm -hmm. that is actually um, he took a lot of uh, of the same ideas from the Levittown family and you know with the slab and and the way that he was constructing the homes quickly and efficiently and mm -hmm. and inexpensively and gave mm -hmm. people like the folks who wound up there an opportunity to buy right. at very low prices mm -hmm. but what the Levitts did that he did not um, do is focus on some sort of community center absolutely now let's talk about the second genesis mm -hmm. as I'd like to call it the <laughs> other planners who are hatching right. up their plans for the environs around Shirley. Yeah. Now, and, and here we deal with a very elite group, eight yes. major uh, Northeastern universities. Right. And uh, it's their charge to design and place a nuclear research facility. Mm -hmm. It's not a nuclear reactor, per se, is it? Um, yes, it's a, the first two were reactors. Reactors, mm -hmm. right. Um, they have this mandate to do this, and they pick that region. But here's the striking thing, and perhaps the origins of so much ill that's, that's going to happen later. Mm -hmm. They seem to do it, Kelly, um, without much concern about what was going to be adjacent to them, because right. surely itself is growing in this era. Right. Um, and then they, well, you answer that first, and then tell me about the attitude that they seem to adopt toward the town yeah. as they put it in place. Well, it was really, uh, reading the founding documents was very exciting because you could see how much hope there was and excitement around the development. It was the first nuclear reactor built just for peaceful purposes. It wasn't built to, you know, increase the weaponry. It wasn't, there were defense-related experiments happening there, right. um, and there was a partition uh, that, sectioned off the, those um, those that were classified and those that were not. Right. So, but originally it was um, made just for peaceful, for mm -hmm. science, pure science. Mm -hmm. And uh, the excitement around that and all the universities and, yeah. and the papers were wonderful. Um, but there was uh, the first, the first reactor that went up um, in the late 40s, early 50s, did wind up, wind up leaking. Yeah. And when they discovered that leak, and there were there were a few accidents where they pumped slurry, radioactive slurry, into um, a drinking water um, well instead of where it was supposed to go, and mm -hmm. things like this. Um, what I think they didn't consider was Long Island is um, basically a sandbar. Exactly. And. Uh, the Pine Barrens act as a recharge basin for what is mm -hmm. one of the largest, one of the country's largest sole source drinking water aquifers. Right. And it serves more than three million people, including the Hamptons and people mm -hmm. out east. The water moves east and south mm -hmm. and on Long Island. And um, so right in the center, they plopped the first reactor. When it leaked, I think there was a moment where they could have mm -hmm. really just look down the block. Yeah. Um, there's a highway that connects, it's just two street lights away and it connects the town. Yeah. And they could have seen this real burgeoning community happening and thought, you know what, our founding documents say we should be more than 10 miles away, we shouldn't be on a water source, mm -hmm. maybe we should rethink this mm -hmm. and go somewhere less populated. Well, this is very well said, Kelly, and very well written, too, because one gets the sense that there are a lot of things that kept them from doing that. Right. Maybe good old-fashioned arrogance was right. one of them. One of the hinges of fate in your book, and this is why it's 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 a memoir, of course, is the death of Jerry, yeah. who's a very charismatic person, uh, much beloved in the community, uh, and uh, his death I found is kind of a hinge of fate. And you mentioned the year 1960 when yes. people are beginning to sense this is leaking into our into our aquifer. Right. Um, I mean, how painful was that discovery? And was that when people began to say, "Look, a lot of us are getting." ill, you know, Jerry is dead and mm -hmm. other people are developing problems and these problems t began to multiply. It was really interesting. As a kid, there were um, people, you know, Jerry joked that he glowed in the dark yeah. and, and that he got green slimed and things like that. And, and it was handled more in that way of this mm -hmm. uh, assumed threat and assumed danger rather than 
understanding what was actually happening there. Mm -hmm. And really, it was Shoreham Nuclear Power Plant that kind of blew open the fact that there were these three um, in succession nuclear reactors already existing when all of the people were saying, we sh you know, Long Island is not a place to have nuclear anything. Right. Um, there's no evacuation route. We're on a sandbar. There, it just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, nuclear. Um, Shoreham is just north of where the lab property is, mm -hmm. and when they realized, oh, we've actually had reactors for more than 40 years at that point, that's when really the heat started getting mm -hmm. getting on them, and, and then Superfund stepped in. Exactly. And it was really in 1989, as Jerry was dying, um, a lot of those first initial studies were being done, mm -hmm. and the extent of the pollution, which hadn't really been mm -hmm. known before that. Um, and the history and the, the um, repetitive nature of those leaks and um, each of those three reactors wound yeah. up leaking. I have to say, Kelly, I found, and, and you recount this history very accurately here, and we see a number of studies, the study that led to the Superfund designation, and then as things progress, there are other studies relating to breast cancer incidents and, and other, uh, there's one, I, uh, illness that affects one in four million children or something. Yeah, rhabdomyosarcoma. Rhabdomyosarcoma. <laughs> Rhabdo is the, is yeah, the father. Yeah, which is, but it, which happens in a, in a great density. Right. In this small town, which is, to mm -hmm. me, is, is a, but here's my point. It just seemed to me that uh, most of the research itself, the studies were themselves not terribly satisfying. No, they weren't. And one thing that I found amazing mm -hmm. is how fluid the studies mm -hmm. are and I think you know the reason I chose memoir to really enter this story is because none of those studies and there have been so many in the Long Island Breast Cancer Study Project which took 10 years and millions of dollars um, was so unsatisfactory for so many people It was a great beginning but um, it really needed to go much deeper and I think when we look at who pays for these studies and mm -hmm. what the results show, um, for instance, the Long Island Breast Cancer Study Project was funded, um, the majority was funded by the Department of Defense, and um, that to me and to a lot of activists on the island felt very like the um, fox watching the hen house. Yeah, precisely. Um, and similar, similarly, and that happens on both sides, I'm not mm -hmm. saying it's just one side, but for every study that I found that mm -hmm. said yes, there's definitely a rise in this particular cancer, in this particular place, um, there was another study saying actually, no, there's fewer cases of those cancers, yeah. and, they, and I realized the reason that they're so unsatisfactory is that none of them reflected my experience growing up in this town and that was why I thought it was so important to really bear witness and talk about the people affected exactly. and the families. And when you talk about the people affected, that really is the great strength of this book because after we talk about public policy sometimes in very disembodied, abstract right. ways, but the real question is how are the people affected? Mm -hmm. And in talking about the people, Kelly, here is um, there are two questions actually kind of related that I found as, as a powerful uh, sub themes in this book mm -hmm. the issue of class right for example it struck me as really interesting that these nine elite universities the Brookhaven crowd the scientists mm -hmm. were so cavalier mm -hmm. about not really engaging in a dialogue or public education or or mm -hmm. anything with the town mm -hmm. um, but we'll answer that first did you was that is the way you felt about it it was actually a difficult road to travel because I didn't realize how ashamed I was of where I came from mm. until I was maybe halfway through the book and realized that was a central question. If this is so beautiful, if my childhood was so magical and so perfect and I wouldn't change it, why am I always so ashamed to say I grew up in Shirley? And I asked my friends and they all felt the same way and our fathers and parents all said, oh, we're from the East End, we're from Mariches, which is a town over. and. Um, and really, it's a class thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a service town to the Hamptons. It's not the Hamptons. We actually even tried to change the town's name to Floyd Harbor <laughs> to, Floyd Harbor mm -hmm. to um, try to mm -hmm. change the reputation. And really, what it comes down to is class mm -hmm. and the idea that I think my sense is that somewhere along the way, um, Places like Brookhampton, uh, Brook, Brookhaven, and um, Brookhampton was one of the ideas right. for the new names of the town. Um, and I think living so close to the Hamptons, mm -hmm. both of those things sent out these messages that you're dispensable. 
and at some point along the way the community really took that in and mm. believed it and yeah, yeah you know that's I mean, that's very nicely made there that point as you just expressed it and mm. you just reminded me because in the book there are also paragraphs that relate to a lot of social dysfunction we see among the town particularly the youth mm -hmm. there's one really hor horrific chapter in here or par some paragraphs where you know people are doing all kinds of dire right. things as a result yeah and it's this feeling well it doesn't matter yeah. anyway our, yeah. our fates are sealed yeah. either we're never leaving or if we leave we're from Shirley and we'll always be from Shirley mm -hmm. and so what is there to really offer us and it's really a stark portrait but yeah. very well depicted the other way in which class plays in this Kelly was when we get a celebrity involved mm -hmm. and in particular I can, I can I can use the name is in the book Anna Wintour the editor right. of Vogue actually gets a mansion close by mm -hmm. and becomes a champion of the uh, campaign against Brookhaven. Yeah. And this brings attention, doesn't it, and money, at least for time? It did, and she um, she actually lives on a colonial homestead, and it's quite beautiful and is really the only place like it in town. The only other place similar is a museum in town, a colonial museum. and. Um, it was fascinating. I actually walked with her in my hometown Christmas parade, and she was a champion of a very amazing homegrown activist named Ron Lubsky. And he's a carpenter. His wife is a school bus driver, and he grew up in the town, as, as did his wife. And the river that their house um, butts up against, uh, usually around mid June, sort of slicks over, and there's a fish kill. Right. And and um, Anna Wintour's house also has this, you know, in the early summer, spring, and fall, it's actually quite lovely and bucolic, but, um, you know, once the fish kill happens, you can't even go outside. The mm -hmm. smell is horrible, of course. And, um, and she, at first, really tried to be anonymous in her donations and help, and slowly she realized she showed up at um, one great little town meeting, and and everybody was shocked and, mm -hmm. and she was wonderful. E suddenly everyone was interested and suddenly people were returning Ron's phone calls whereas before they weren't and it really, uh, Shirley and the Hamptons have had an uncomfortable marriage for right. a long time. I mean, they survive, their survival depends on each other mm -hmm. and I think uh, even if we don't want to admit that really, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just the way things work and while clearly there was self-interest involved, I do think it took a lot of guts for Anna Wintour to stand yeah. up next to this carpenter. Well, indeed, indeed, and it does bring attention to the town and the cause. Yeah. Of course, it, it also points out the disparities. I think she, at one point, there's an auction mm -hmm. hosted and $150,000 are raised by the Shirley people right. in benefit of the cause. Meanwhile, further down the road, yes. the Hamptons are raising $790,000 exactly. in excess for, for their, their cause. And that was another environment, and a wonderful environmental group, but yeah. because that was in the Hamptons, yeah. uh, there just wasn't a chance. Yeah. It's, it's also worth mentioning, because it's also brought out in the book, that um, Shirley is also the site of the TWA right. 800 disaster, yes. so there might have been even a further sense of we are cursed. Oh, right? absolutely. And after that happened, um, again, it's that dispensable feeling because mm -hmm. a lot of people saw something, mm -hmm. um, saw something move from the ground up to the plane, or that's what they said they saw. And uh, their, again, their eyewitness accounts were discounted. Mm -hmm. And so it's just another e example of, it doesn't matter what you think or what you saw or what you feel. Yeah, it doesn't match the official yeah, version. Yeah, you're so. dispensable. Kelly, as we come to the um, end of the tale, so to speak, or at least the point where we should be drawing lessons. I wonder what you might say they are. I mean, certain things did occur to me that environmental protections have to be thought of at the outset, and there has to be better town laboratory communication. But what are the principles for this kind of joint endeavor, a town and a, a uh, laboratory? Well, Shirley really is a true microcosm class-wise and environmental-wise for much of America. Um, many of the national laboratories, especially the ones focusing on weapons and um, not just pure science, have these sort of blue-collar dumping grounds mm. right next to them. And it's not 
simply a government issue, obviously, a civil action. There was Woburn, and that was blue collar, right. and, you know, um, and Hinckley, which was the Aaron Brockovich case, that was blue collar. And it, I think that really the ultimately, unfortunately, um, activism is a luxury. EPA.gov is an amazing resource, I think, for finding out what's going on in your own community with the mapping techniques and everything they have available. But I think, really, it's, it's almost more a question of tone. I think if the laboratory was more open, and even yeah. if they admitted, they refused to admit that, they, that a relationship any kind of relationship even exists between the town and the lab. And I understand there are implications if if they did say there was a relationship, the implications mm -hmm. that would follow would be difficult or uncomfortable. Right. But I think if there was some kind of I mean, culpability is an issue, but with Superfund they're working hard to clean it up. Mm -hmm. um, it's really what now? Now that the damage is done, is there a way to make up for it aside above and beyond cleaning it up? Mm -hmm. And I think really the promise of not doing that again, um, really looking forward to the future of nuclear energy in this country, what that means and taking the people into account. Yes. And not just what's on the paper. If a nuclear reactor works the way it works on paper, hey, maybe that's you know, sounds suddenly like oh, a good idea. I, I, think that, I think that's tremendously important, Kelly, right. and I th really think that's why the book is so important, because, um, and I, I, I was glad to hear you say that, because my perception as a reader was that it was attitude. Yeah. It's the stonewalling. I mean, yeah. even the part where you're doing the research after the fact, and you know, yes. you're trying to get access, the grudging sort of, you know, here you have it, mm -hmm. take it, uh, but it's not very generous or no. forthcoming. Kelly, thank you so much for having written this book. And uh, like I said before, I think everyone should read it. Let me hold it up one more time. Thank you. For everyone to see. Welcome to Shirley. Read and learn. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would say. Thanks so much. You're so welcome. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at Dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George Liston CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue is also on the MHC Worldview channel which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. Please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching this week. Kelly McMasters, thank you for writing. Thanks so much. The Art of Conversation, Dialogue at the Woodrow Wilson Center features 20 years of dialogue, distributed by the John Hopkins University Press, www.press.jhu.edu.